Um, good. Okay, welcome everyone to the next lecture on machine learning. I'm glad to see so many people. I'm wondering how many you are, maybe 30 or so. That's quite okay, I guess, but it's also okay to sit at home and, and watch the video. I don't mind. So, as we just seen in the Elias, but the uh, video people didn't see it, but there was a question about deep learning. And then just there's a nice diagram that one can draw about where deep learning is, okay? So, my diagram looks like this. This is AI. So this is the field of artificial intelligence. And there are some... Ah, very good. Thank you. Wow, you're really prepared now. So did it work? Yeah, now it works. Thank you, very good. So this is a nice diagram. So this is the area of artificial intelligence. Maybe the rest is this one and everything is the rest. So this is AI research and there are differently sized bubbles in there, okay? So there are the connectionists guys. So those are the neural network guys. Then there are the support vector machine guys. And then there might be also some others like logical AI guys, okay? And through time, the size of these bubbles are changing, okay? And new bubbles are coming. Maybe there's a new bubble called machine learning at some point, or maybe it's starting very small, so it's starting like this. And it's part of the neural network guys, they are in here too. The logical AI is very really large, so that's like in the 70s, yeah, where you think with mathematical methods you can solve the AI problem. and the machine learning thing is developing and getting larger and larger. Yeah, maybe, I don't know, this might be the stage 1990 or 1995, I have no idea. And suddenly this bubble gets larger and larger and larger. And there's another bubble in here. Those are the neural network, which are now called deep learning. Okay, so how does an updated image look like? An updated image looks like this. So this is now machine learning, yeah? And this is now deep learning. I'm a bit exaggerating, but it is really like that. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning because deep learning is using some particular models, some particular methods to do machine learning. And machine learning is a set of methods to do artificial intelligence. But it's currently kind of taking over many of the other areas. So there's also an overlapping Thing maybe of logical AI where people are also thinking so how can I use probabilities or probabilistic methods or deep learning maybe to do some logical AI tasks okay so another diagram to put it is that AI is the superset of ML which is the superset of deep learning okay so that's where the deep learning is here and then just very briefly what is deep learning deep learning is a particular way of modeling this function f which goes from the input to the output. Okay, and then this function f has lots of parameters. Those are the weights of your deep learning methods. And what's so special about it, it's such a, it's like a gigantically large function, but it's only using mathematics from primary school, luckily. So it's only using plus, times, and maximum. Okay, those are the things that you learn in primary school and those are the functions that you need for deep learning. I'm a bit exaggerating, but the RELU nonlinearity, if you know it, is just using maximum. If you have a neural network with RELU, there is nothing else than this. If you have something with a tangent hyperbolic course or SIG model, you have more operations, of course. But in principle, this, the single operations are very simple, but you use lots of them, okay? And the nice thing is these operations can be run in parallel so you can make use of these graphics cards. And that's why they're booming so much, because these GPUs that were designed for computer games, right? Actually, a GPU was bought to connect a screen on it, right? So it also had an output for a screen. But um, they were designed for um, basically um, doing lots of computations for different areas on the screen and lots of the same computations. So they're parallel computers that are all running the same program on a different part of the screen, approximately, or a different part of your 3D model of a game or something. And um, then researchers were using these ones also for neural networks because these operations are matrix, matrix multiplications, which could be parallelized as well, okay? And 
they could also be implemented on a GPU. So because you have always the same operations and you can run it in parallel. And then more and more money was put into this research how to make these parallel machines super duper fast and you can just buy them and put it into a computer and then you can do, you do this deep learning like with really large models. The other thing with deep learning is deep learning uses stochastic gradient descent. We will learn about it, what it is, but the key here is you take a training example, you process it, kind of extract some information from it and then you discard it and you take the next one. So if your data set increases, yeah, then the computation time will increase with the same rate, which doesn't sound so good first, but the good thing is if your uh, data set is increasing with O of N, your running time will also increase with O of N. And that's not true for many other methods, right? Many other methods, they scale with N squared, right? If you would calculate a distance matrix on all your examples, then suddenly you would have a method which is going like N squared with larger data sets. So the good thing about deep learning is it's a method that scales very well with faster hardware and with more data. I think that's key to its success. Yeah? And um, the techniques from deep learning are basically the same as in the 80s. Yeah? So that, that's basically where everything has been written up how to do it. But the computers were not fast enough. And then people came up with other methods to solve things. And now the computers are super fast and we have lots of data. So deep learning is really super successful. So then why are we doing machine learning and why don't we just do deep learning? I mean, machine learning is much more than deep learning. So there are many methods and like the cool researchers in deep learning who really push the frontier of what's possible. They use the ideas of machine learning and apply them in their deep learning methods, for example. So it's, it's important to know the whole story. The same, of course, it would be also important to take a class on AI, right? And have a class on that one to also learn about those concepts. There are very interesting, sophisticated search algorithms, for example, in AI. Again, and then you can combine them with your deep learning engine and you have something new and something that is more powerful than the old stuff. Okay, so that is like the thing to remember, AI, machine learning, deep learning. This is the ordering here. Good. Okay, and now we will talk about monsters and mouse today. Maybe you've seen this already when you looked at the slides. Let me see how I can switch. No, that was the wrong button. Hmm. Now, ah, again, this stupid bug. So what's wrong here? Does it work now? Yeah, okay. So let's get started with section two. So this is a coincidence that it's also lecture two, but this is section two, it's the second topic. And it will, about, will be about plausible reasoning and base rule. So basically here I will motivate the use of probabilities for plausible reasoning, okay? And um, that is interesting by itself, right? Because maybe a robot or an intelligent machine should reason about the world and the way to reason could be logic or it could be logic plus probabilities, okay? And that's something that I'm proposing here. However, also the probabilities are interesting by themselves because when you start talking about, so what are you really doing when you're doing deep learning? What does it mean to have a data set? Once we can talk about probabilities, we could say there is a joint distribution of inputs and outputs. And from that one, I can sample a training data set. That's, those are my observation and kind of the distribution, the joint distribution is describing nature, what, how things work. Okay. And I can sample examples and I can learn on these examples. And generalization now means if I take this learned machine and apply it to a test data set, which has been sampled from the same joint distribution, yeah, then it's still working very well. Or it's not working very well, yeah, as we will see. So to talk about the other concepts, probabilities are omnipresent. However, they are also interesting by themselves yeah, as, a, as a way to reason about uh, the world around us, right? To reason about how much money to bet that Borussia Dortmund will become the Deutscher Meister this year, for example. How much money should you bet on it? Okay, for example. And I guess in Dortmund, more people are betting large amounts of money than in, in, in Munich, probably. By the way, you could make money by knowing this one. Anyway, so plausible reasoning. Before we get to that, I have updated my list of books. In particular, there are lots of more books that are free online, okay? And let me briefly go through some of these books. 
So those are now, it's a list of books which I found and they're in particular for those who might think their math is a bit rusty or they never understood it anyway, okay? So those are good books to look up what a vector is or what a matrix is, right? And all the basics, how to calculate derivatives and all these things. So let's um, start with maybe one recommendation, this one, Mathematics for Machine Learning from Mark Dysonroth and colleagues. Um, so this is a very nice introduction of the mathematics that you need for machine learning. Of course, you need a lot of mathematics, but they present it in a way with having you in mind. So the examples will be from machine learning, okay? And it's not a math introduction. So I think they don't care so much about whether um, a vector space exists or something like that, whether we need to use Zorn's lemma that every vector space has a basis or something like this. So that's not such an issue for them. They are more very concrete. What can you do with matrices? What can you do with vectors? So that's a very nice one. And it's completely available for free online. Yeah? And you can also order it. And that's a pattern that you see very often now in machine learning and also in other fields. So when you look at the publishers here, Cambridge, 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 that's a very nice publisher. It's from University Press Cambridge. And they give away their books for free as well. Okay, and you can buy them. Good, some other book on linear algebra is this one from Stefan Boyd and Lieven van der Berger, Introduction to Applied Linear Algebra. So the Stefan Boyd is an optimization person, but he's more also a hands-on optimization person. So also his book on convex optimization is very readable for non-mathematicians. And mathematicians also look at it, right? I mean, I like the convex optimization book of him very much because it just gives me like the overview of everything without every little detail sometimes. But then when I want to see the details, I could look up the yellow Springer books as well. But sometimes I don't want it. Sometimes I just want to know what is the dual gap and I want to just read about it. So this authors, those two authors are, um, so the Dyson Road book and the Boyd books, they are very good. Then there's another one which I haven't read yet. So there is a new book called Linear Algebra Done Right, which is yet another book on linear algebra. I haven't looked into the book, but there's a short version of it called Linear Algebra Abridged. Just put it on your shelf or on your bookmarks, okay? And when you have a concept you don't understand, go through the different sources and see which one fits your background. Then there's another one, very new introduction to probability for data science. Yet another book. Um, it's also available for free online. I don't know whether it's available as a PDF or as a web page, but yeah, who cares, right? I mean, web page would be also fine. And then there's another one, Bayesian optimization book. And this I just put for completeness. It's already a bit expert. It's on how to do global optimization of function with Bayesian method with Gaussian processes and stuff. Yeah? Just collect these books, right? And then at some point you think, ah, there's this topic of Bayesian optimization. There was a book I have already and I can look it up. Okay, so those, this is just some literature. Okay, but let's start now with the new important things of today. If you forgot the topic, it's plausible reasoning and base rule. So this is Laplace, and I put some quotes in there which I like, right? Of course, there are so many quotes out there, right? Whatever you want to say, you will find the famous person that said it. But um, yeah, this is perfect, right? Life's most important questions are, for the most part, nothing but probability problems. This should be enough motivation to learn about probability. Of course, for other topics, you might have similar statements. But the more you think about it, um, you might see some truths in here, right? I mean, we as human beings, we perceive our world, right? Which are basically noisy measurements of our surrounding, right? We might see a cloudy sky and we need to decide whether it will be raining or not, right? So we are inference machines and we need to deal with unsafe knowledge. It's not like one plus one equals two. It's like a bit fuzzy, everything, right? And so probabilities are very useful for this as we will see today. So, and we will, we will view probability theory as an extension of logic. Wow, this sounds cool, right? I mean, this logic is cool and then having an extension of logic and connecting probabilities to it. I personally am quite excited about it. And so was E.T. James. So there was a, a reference on the first lecture from the book from E.G. James. I think the book is called The Logic of Science. And I think there are PDF versions, legal PDF versions around of the book that you can read, maybe of a draft of the book. And um, I'm basically following his section one here for motivating probabilities. 
So, and this is about deductive and plausible reasoning. So, I will briefly explain you what deduction is with giving you an example here. And this will be our running example. So, there are two statements. One statement is, it will start to rain by 6 p.m. today. And the other statement is, the sky will become cloudy before 6 p.m. And from your world knowledge, you know that there is a connection between the two, right? And so, let's express this world knowledge. We know, for example, if A is true, so if it starts to rain at 6, then B must be also true, okay? Then it must be really cloudy before 6 p.m., yeah? otherwise it cannot rain, yeah? I will change my opinion on this statement a bit in a second, but let's keep it like this. So now if I know A is true, yeah, so if it really started to rain at, at 6, then I can conclude that B must be true too. And so this is logical inference and called modus ponens. Yeah? So basically you have a statement a implies B, and you have the statement A, yeah, and from this you can always infer that B is also true. Okay, so this is modus ponens. And now what does deduction mean? Deduction mean you have a set of um, true statements, axioms or premises, and you draw a conclusion from it by using logical inference rules. Okay, and the logical inference rule we are using here is called modus ponens. And there are many others, for example, from the statement A and B, you could infer that A is true, okay? So that is another rule, and this is called deduction, okay? And deduction can be mechanized for first-order logic, so there's a calculus for this, so it can be kind of automated in a way. So then you know the other ones, maybe if you've done some mathematics before, what about if we have the same assumption, A implies B, but now we say B is false? Then for sure, yeah, Oops, we can also infer that A is false. And this also has a nice name, it's called modus tollens. Or I think in German we always said contraposition. I don't know whether, maybe in English contraposition, I don't know whether it's also the same thing. So that's sometimes, those are things that you use in proofs, okay? So this is deductive reasoning, maybe for completeness. So there are these two things, deduction and then there's induction, which you might have heard already about it, okay? So deduction is, where you have statements and you use logical rules to infer another statement, and induction means you've seen examples, and from that you generalize to have a for all statement. Okay, so that is induction. Like whatever you've seen um, in your life, you've seen many sheep, yeah, and they were all white, and then you infer all sheep are white. Okay, sheeps, what's the plural of sheep? I don't know, whatever. So that is induction. Just as another side note, open bracket, this is just like side notes. The mathematical induction, how does it fit in here? Mathematical induction is itself a rule like this one here, yeah, like modus tollens or something modus ponens, and it says if you can prove something about the number zero and you can prove something about, about the number n plus one, if you assume that you know the statement for n, then the axiom of induction tells us that then it must be true for all natural numbers. So this is the induction principle applied to the natural numbers. But the induction principle itself could be seen as an axiom that you put in for deductive reasoning. Okay? So just for the curious, if you really want to use the words deduction and induction correctly, have a look at it, but I won't ask about it in the exam. Okay? Just for your own curiosity. Okay, so far so good. This is a logical robot can do these things, okay? So now here comes a more difficult task. Now we need plausibility. So what if I still know this mechanism kind of thing, A implies B, but I don't know A is true, but I know B is true, right? As a mat mathematician, I would say, ah, bad luck, right? I mean, then you cannot infer anything, right? I mean, that's just not a valid deduction rule. However, Somehow it's plausible that A becomes more plausible, right? If I know that A implies B, and then I observe B, it should make A more plausible, right? And that's true, I mean, if you talk about the story, when you see that the sky gets cloudy at, at 5.30 or something, then it becomes more plausible that it will start to rain at 6. So that is our everyday experience. Now, if we would have a robot which is running around, and it would just use deductive reasoning, it would be very limited in, in what it could perceive and how it would interpret the world. So it would be nice also to include some plausible reasoning. And the 
basically the, the spoiler is plausible reasoning can be done with probabilities, right? So that is the nice thing. So we can also do it the other way around. We could, of course, also assume A is false. And also here in mathematics, you couldn't say anything, right? If A is false, A implies B doesn't help you. However, in the real world, B becomes less plausible, right? So if it doesn't rain, so now I'm just getting out of the building at 6.15 and I'm seeing it's not raining, then I would infer probably it wasn't very cloudy at 5.30 as well. Okay, so that totally makes sense. Good, so here's the summary. So basically we have an assumption A implies B, but I used words to describe it because plausibility or this plausible reasoning is, is really how we humans are talking about these things. So I didn't explicitly not want to formalize it. And then we have basically seen these statements that they all kind of make sense. That doesn't mean that I have proved them. I, I just wanted to make, you know, to give you an example that they kind of make sense. And if you have a counter example, then please tell me. I will include it into the lecture. But I think in plausible reasoning, um, these things are really true. The good thing is I call it plausible. That is a word that you haven't seen in your math or in your computer science classes yet. So it's a new word. So I keep it. I leave it a bit fuzzy, right? It's that what we are doing, but I'm not exactly telling you what we are doing, okay? Good. Um, let's relax that even more. So suppose we now replace the A is true implies B, but let's just say A is true, then B is more plausible, right? So I said if it's really raining, it there must be cloudy, right? However, let's extend the story a bit. There's a film set outside, okay, and they have a big construction and they can let it rain by pressing a button, okay, then it doesn't have to be cloudy. So in real, in real life, there are always exceptions to the rules, right? It's not these super logical mechanisms. It's more like things get more plausible, but it doesn't mean that they, they are immediately completely true. So it would be nice if we could also model that one with probabilities, because if we then know that B is true, then that makes A more plausible, okay, for the same reason. So this is a weaker statement than the one that we've seen before, yeah, but even if it's not then B is true, only if B is more plausible, the whole thing still works. And we can also do it the other way around and the other way around. So here's the summary, basically. So this is the stuff that we just seen at the beginning, A implies B. This is a relaxed statement, A implies B becomes more plausible, and then here I worked out the different situations, what I can infer if I assume A is true or false, or B is true or false, what does it mean, okay? And we now want to formalize this plausibility, and we will see that this can be done with probabilities, okay? So one approach is from Cox, and um, there are the so-called Cox axioms, they're trying to formalize common sense, and that's what we were talking about. Yeah, this plausible reasoning kind of is our our allgemein wissen, yeah, our, our weltwissen, the common sense. And the way he's doing it is he says, first of all, the plausibility of B, assuming that A is true, should be a real number, and I give it a name. This real number gets a name, P of A given B. Okay, but this is just a name for this one. And then he says, my plausibility, so he calls these p plausibilities. Of course, at the end, those will be our probabilities, but he calls them first plausibilities. They should comply with common sense. And this is like this shaky statement. This is not really mathematics, right? So this is more having a, giving people a questionnaire. What do you think? Is it more likely here or there? And then you could maybe poll about it, but it's not super strict and super rigorous, right? So it's a bit hand wavy. And the other statement as well, it should be consistent, yeah, whatever that means. For this, he would have to look into his paper, what he really meant it and where he is really using it. But from these three statements, which sounds quite okay, you can derive the product rule for these plausibilities and the sum rule. And those are exactly the product rule and the sum rule that you also have for probabilities. Okay? And so this Cox is a celebrated person for for the Bayesian people, so the, who likes Bayesian statistics. So this is a very interesting way to have a foundation for probabilities, to derive it like that, okay? And you, you might be asking, so why do we get multiplication? Why do we get summation? Why do these operations come from? And that comes from this complies with common sense. There might be some statement like, if this is whatever, half as likely as that one, and then how should it be combined, and blah, blah, blah. And the other thing is, 
So it should be between zero and one. If you model it like that, then you get certain operations, okay? And then you get plus and times, and those are the right operations. So when you look at that one, the product rule can be written one or the other way. Um, maybe let me first write um, a simplified version of the product rule to the board. So where am I? Here. So a simplified version of that one is basically P of A comma B is equal to P of A given B times P of B. And next time, yeah. Ah, okay. The comma has a certain meaning, the bar has a certain meaning. And I will now just read it, and I would read it like the probability or the plausibility of A and B. So it's like a logical and, okay? P, yeah, oh yeah, of course. It's symmetric as well, so it doesn't matter. Good that you asked. This is a very nice motivation for the next section. Um, however, from just from the notation here, kind of he derives these kind of formulas, okay, that you can have a product rule and having these properties. And what you are referring will be done then after this introduction to this plausible reasoning, I'm trying to really formally introduce what this exactly means and what stuff are you allowed to put in here. Yeah? That's a very good question because sometimes you run into situations where your intuitive pattern matching on this kind of stuff kind of fails. Okay, so we will explain that in, in great detail. However, okay, what I wanted to say is, so you can apply it in one or the other way around. So you can also first have the other variable, and then this thing is called conditioned on, okay? Or assuming that this stuff is true, times P of A, okay? And that is the simpler version. But I can put the condition on C. I can put it everywhere in here as well, okay? And then we have the formulas that we see on the screen. Okay, my buttons, they don't work. Okay, whatever. So that is then a formula that we can derive. The good thing is, for us, right, as practitioners, we only care about these two rules, and that's the stuff that we use for calculating around the things. So that's basically then our calculus. We don't have to care anymore about the stuff where it came from. We only need these rules at the end, okay? Actually, it turns out, here we are talking about logical statements, but just as a preview, when the P is a density function of continuous distribution, the rules also hold. So you can use the rules also for density functions, which is quite nice. Anyway, this product rule will, infer, uh, will imply base rule, which I explain in a second, okay? But just... As a side note. So here's a different approach called from Kolmogorov. So those are Kolmogorov's axioma, and this is more rigorous, okay? So I think the Cox is more like the physicist way of thinking, so you, you do it until it works, kind of. Maybe that's a prejudice of mine, but um, my impression is like the physicists, they can solve every integral, and they have these superpowers of doing calculations, but sometimes they are like a bit hand wavy and it converges against zero, so it's going to infinity and it's one, or something like this, okay? And Kolmogorov is a mathematician, so this is now super strict and rigorous. And he now models the plausibility using a measure, okay? And this is measure as in measure theory, okay? And you know measure theory is infinitesimal rechnung drei, typically, or something. It's like, it's like a tough topic. It's not so easy with sigma algebras and so on and so forth. However, it's actually at the end, let's translate measure just with yardstick or in German Zollstock, okay? So everything that can be measured, like with the yardstick, that is measurable, okay? And the analogy is, is not really that bad because when you do measure theory, you need to define what can be measured and typically you define it in such a way that everything that can be measured with a yardstick, so which is an interval basically that has a certain length, and then doing some sigma combinations, yeah, that's the stuff that you can measure. So the yardstick is not that bad. So the measure theory is just a way to formally kind of um, specify what can be measured, what can be quantified, kind of, okay? And that's fine and that's enough for us. 
important thing is that there are certain axioms it must hold. So for probability measure, Kolmogorov assumes that um, it must be always between zero and one. Yeah, you might be asking, what is this a anyway? So yeah, that might be a true statement, which is true or false. So it could be like a propositional variable or something. Okay, but we will specify exactly what it is. But so it must be between zero and one, and that's an arbitrary choice. He could have chosen it to be between zero and a hundred. Okay, that's totally okay. That's an arbitrary choice. He wants to have the probability of the true event, like the event that is always true. He wants to have it to be one. And he wants to have this formula if A and B are mutually exclusive, so not both of them can be true at the same time, yeah, then basically the statement of P, A, or B should be just a summation. So and from these axioms, you can also derive interesting formulas, yeah? For example, these ones that are basically very similar to these um, rules that we just seen, yeah? So basically it's the same as the sum rule that you can derive from the axioms. Where do we get the product rule? The product rule we get by now defining this conditional probability. So Kolmogorov is not starting with the P of B given A, but he's just starting with measuring these events, P of A, okay, without giving something, but he defines it himself. So he says P of B given A is defined to be as a quotient of these probabilities that are defined up here, okay? And the way he defines this is in such a way that it's exactly the product rule, right? If you bring the P of A to the other side, then basically this is the product rule, okay? So here the product rule follows by definition of the conditional probability. Good, also here we get Bayes rule, which I explain in great detail in a second. So those are also nice pictures of these superstars of probabilities. Um, I'm always wondering how you pronounce this. Do we have a, a person with English mother tongue or ideally like an Oxfordian or Cambridgean accent? Can someone sell this? Threlkeld? I don't know. Nobody. Any Russians among us who can just read this nice name here? Anybody can speak Russian? No, this time not. I think it was, oh yeah. Okay, very nice. Okay, I think he would have liked it that we um, have his name here in his lecture pronounced correctly and not Kolmogorov, something like this. I always say Kolmogorov. So it's only an approximation to the to the right melody here. So basically they both model plausibilities. So here the starting point is they should comply with common sense and then he defines P of B given A and then he derives base rule from it. We will see what it is. And he's a mathematician and he kind of, he has measure theory, like he has really the, the big hammer on his table and he models probability theory using measure theory, okay? And he defines P of A and he also defines P of B given A such that the product rule holds. So here it's basically defined, okay? Kolmogorov's approach is typically more rigorous. However, both are kind of interesting, right? I mean, even if people find a bug in the proof of Richard Cox, nonetheless, it's interesting that he gets so far, that he gets something like the sum and the product rule from a totally different, with a totally different approach which might be a bit buggy at some places where he talks about common sense or something, where one could argue whether this is the way to do it or not. But nonetheless, I think it's quite interesting. So the debate might be is base rule an axiom or not, but at the end, who cares? I mean, we just want to have the sum rule and we want to have the product rule. That's what we care about. And the foundation of this, um, it doesn't matter so much for us. Yeah? Both approaches to give a foundation kind of shed some light on the deeper meaning of these things. Good, so here comes Bayes' rule. Here's another quote. The theory of probability is basically just common sense reduced to calculus. Quite remarkable, right? I mean, he already knew it, that uh, you could use kind of common sense to derive probabilities. By the way, Laplace, I think, I mean, I should have looked up his biography, but I think he's a gambler and he wants to play games and he wants to win at those games. And that's why he wants to play around with probabilities, right? So he wants to find out for certain games what amount of money can I bet on a coin or what amount of money should I bet on a certain rule of dice where I win or not, right? So that's a great motivation. So you see, again, playing games can be a great motivation to inventing scientific concepts that are 
super useful 200 years ago still, right? Um, actually, another example is in reinforcement learning, like it was gaining a lot of attention again when people at DeepMind starting to do Atari games. And Atari games are those computer games from the 80s. And that was the test bed for the algorithms. And it wasn't be possible before to run reinforcement learning algorithms on these Atari games, and they showed how to do it. And that was giving the field a big push, right, by looking at these games, or playing the game of Go, or these kind of things, yeah? So if you're a playful person, stay like it, yeah? Stay playful, then that's the best way to become a famous scientist. Good, so here comes base rule. So inverting probability. So that's what I'm writing here. First of all, the image is quite interesting. So the signature, is assumed to be his signature. The image people typically argue is not the image of Thomas Bayes, but it's the image that someone who wrote a paper or a book um, where he was referring to Thomas Bayes put into his book. But like super historian experts, they say this kind of clothes is not typical of the time when Thomas Bayes lived. So it can't be Thomas Bayes, um, or he must have had a very weird fashion taste, okay, which is, was not with his time at that point. So, but whatever, this is a phase that I'm thinking of when I'm thinking about Thomas Bayes. So there's no better one. It's wrong, but it's like a good approximation. So, up inverting probability. So where is the inversion happening? So you see P of B given A, yeah, so B first and then the A, and the inversion is happening here on the left-hand side that P of A given B. So let's think about it. So this one is kind of um, having one direction of reasoning, right? For example, when it's cloudy, it will start to rain, okay? That's maybe A is cloudy and B is it starts to rain, or was it the other way around? Maybe it was the other way around, but who cares? And on the other side of the equation, it's the other way around. What, how likely is it that it's cloudy if I see that it rains, okay? So it's really inverting the mechanism. Or it could be also that the A is like the image or the 3D representation of all of you, yeah? And when I take a picture of you with my little camera, I get a 2D representation of you in here, yeah? And maybe it's a bit shaky, and so it's blurry, and I want to have a sharp image, or I want to have the 3D representation. Then there might be the physics are fully understood, right? P of my image, given that there's a certain 3D configuration, can be calculated with ray tracing or with some other, the light field could be simulated and I really know what's going on here, but actually I'm interested in the other way around. I have the image in my box, I upload it in my computer and I want back the 3D reconstruction. So I'm interested in P of the 3D reconstruction given that I have an image, okay? Also there I want to invert the process. And that's very common in physics where I'm um, measuring something that is invisible, right? For example, in an electron microscope, you are measuring something with your complicated machine, but actually you are interested maybe in the atoms of a molecule, okay? And so the forward model is clear how maybe the, the molecule is generating your image, but when you have your blurry image, it's unclear to go back. And this is exactly what Bayes rule is doing. I'm not saying, yeah, we now should use Bayes rule for these kind of problems, but I just want to motivate why it's about inverting something. So it's really inverting the thing. So what does this formula tell us? It tells us basically that this, quotient, this, this condition gets inverted if I multiply it with this quotient of P of A divided by P of B. Okay, so that's one way to view Bayes, Bayes rule. However, there's another view about it. It could be what is this A in my 3D reconstruction example? So the, 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 the 3D rendering of you would be the A, and my 2D image is the B, right? So first, I have a prior distribution on 3D renderings. So I know something already. I need to press a button. Yeah. So I'm, I um, know already something about the A. Okay, so here's my prior. P of A, and what do I know? Okay, from taking lots of pictures, they almost always look the same kind of, I have a lot of chairs and some people are sitting there, but where exactly you are sitting is every time it's different, okay? But if I haven't taken the picture yet, I have a certain prior of what to expect. Then I do the measurement, 
to my measurement is my picture, and then I update my beliefs. So now, given that I have observed my 2D image, I have a new probability distribution on the possible 3D things. So this is what updating your beliefs means. You have some prior assumption, you get measurement, and then you update your assumption. Okay, so this is very, very basic. Um, so how does the formula look like? Let's write it slightly different. So basically, I'm having a P of A in the formula, and this P of A is multiplied by a quotient, and it will be the quotient of P of B given A divided by P of B. So can we also interpret these things? Yeah, so somehow this thing is describing my measurement process, right? So this is doing the ray tracing and generating a 2D image of it. So this is the physics here. And this might be a probability distribution over typical images that I get, okay? And somehow the ratio, maybe how surprising this particular B is compared with this, its initial probability, if I don't have a particular configuration, this ratio is telling me whether the P of A given B is more likely than the P of A or not, okay? So this ratio kind of could be interpreted like that. So with base rule, you can always talk a lot about it, and we will. So this is the first statement. It inverts probabilistic relationships, which is interesting for science. Um, so often it looks like this. We might have hypotheses. So those were the typical 3D renderings or something, 3D locations of you. But it could be also the hypothesis about whatever Jupiter has 20 moons, okay? That could be a hypothesis, or Jupiter has 90 moons or 80 moons, okay? You have a certain distribution because you've seen already some planets, and then you know already how many they approximately have. Then you see some data, yeah? You look through the telescope, you get an image, and you know when it has 20 moons, and you know what to expect from your telescope, yeah? And Basically, after seeing the data, you have a new distribution on the number of moons, okay? So that's base rule. So before you see the data, it's all the stuff on the right-hand side. Now those are like these Bayesian statements, so you value your beliefs as probabilities. And that sounds so easy and it is so hard, right? For the moons, for example, you would have to give a distribution over the number of moons that you are expecting or you could take a uh, distribution, whatever, that you fit into other solar systems or whatever, okay? Sometimes you just cannot value your beliefs very well, okay? And then your inference will be also very bad. That's just how it is. Um, so without seeing any data, I have a prior belief what to expect, and this is expressed in my prior distribution. So assuming that I'm having a certain number of moons, a certain hypothesis, I know how the data should look like, and that is described by the so-called likelihood, okay? It's just a name, okay? Likely is another synonym for probable, and they didn't want to call it probability for a certain reason, which I'll tell you in a second. So those are just names to these things that are commonly used. But more important is that you understand that it's coming from the product rules and that it's inverting these things. So this symbolistic thing, that's more important. So. Knowing that it is wrong, yeah, the likelihood is that the hypothesis is wrong will be P of data given not age. So here, assuming that the age is like a true statement. But in principle, of course, the age could be an integer, it could be whatever thing you could think of. It could be images, it could be everything, okay? Then get, there is the evidence. The evidence is P of the data. It's yet another random name for an expression in here. And note that it can be calculated from the top two quantities by summing out the hypothesis. So there is this sum rule, and basically p of data given age times p of age can be rewritten as p of data comma age, okay, plus p of data comma not age, excuse me, and then there is a rule for that one, the sum rule, that you can get rid of it, okay? So the p of data is a bit weird, but it basically says, how likely is it that I see this particular measurement yeah, under my model assumptions? Okay, that is what it is measuring. Good, after I've seen the data, I can update my beliefs, and that's another word I calculate the posterior beliefs, so the afterwards belief. 
okay, which is p of h given the data. Good, so base rule tells you how to update your beliefs. And the thing that I've drawn here on the uh, blackboard, this should show updating the belief is your initial belief is your prior, your after seeing the data belief is your posterior, this other thing, okay? Good, and this is very basic and very appealing. Unfortunately, not always applicable, right? Because of technicalities, okay? So the problems are at the end integrals. So where is the integral hidden here? So why is there an integral in here? The problem is summation rule, of course, can be generalized to continuous numbers, and then the summation rule maybe um, becomes an integration, okay? So the integration is basically summation of a continuous variable, and so this integral is then something that you cannot calculate often in practice. Sometimes you can, but not always, okay? And then practical computations becomes very complicated. However, kind of now we are more philosophers right now. So we enjoy the beauty of the simple, easily understandable formula, and we will keep it in mind, and we will try it, and we sometimes fail with it. Good, here's an example where we won't fail. This is a monster versus mouse example. Actually, I must say I forgot whether I invented it myself or whether I got it from one of the books. So if one of you finds it somewhere, tell me, I will put back the link in here. If you can't find it, then probably I invented it six years ago. Good, so here's the story. So you're trying, you're trying to sleep, yeah? and then you hear some noise under the bed, okay? So now you're wondering, is it a monster or a mouse, or is it something else? So let's try, try to formalize it. So let's have a Boolean variable here, n, which is basically true or false, and it has a value depending on whether there's a noise under the bed or not. So if it's true, then there's noise under the bed. Then there's a variable capital M, like monster, which is true if there's a monster under the bed, and a variable M, which is also a, a true-false variable, whether there's a mouse under the bed or something else, okay? And I told you already what type do these variables have. They, they are Boolean, yeah? they are just true and false or propositional variables. And um, the thing why I'm saying that already, it's only one way to model it. There are zillions of ways. And here I need the additional assumption now. I want to have these three variables to be mutually exclusive. That means only one of them should be true, okay? I could have modeled it also with a variable that is called S, like the stuff under your bed, and it's having three values, okay? That would have been another option, having a single variable for the stuff under your bed, and the value could be either monster, mouse, or something else. But instead, the notation is much nicer if I'm using three propositional variables here. But only one of them can be true. That's important, and I sh show you why, because now we need to assign probabilities here, prior probabilities to these numbers, yeah? Uh, to these um, symbols here in such a way that the summation of these three options is equal to one. And that's another way to say that they are mutually exclusive, kind of, okay? So they should sum up to one. One of them will be true, but only one of them. Okay, how do you assign the probabilities? This is where your world knowledge comes in. Maybe you, you can derive it from the amount of money you spend every month for your flat, right? Whether you have a mouse under your bed, if you don't spend so much money, maybe there are more mice, and otherwise there won't be a mouse. Whether there's a monster under your bed, that's like a more complicated question, which is probably philosophical. If something else is under the bed, yeah, that's then related to the other two, right? If you know everything about the amount of monsters and the amount of mouses, mouses, mice, under your bed, yeah, then you know everything about the something else. Because you can just solve this equation for P of E, and P of E is just the rest, okay? So, for example, you don't really believe in monsters, but there are situations where there are monsters under the bed because, whatever, you are, you're making a movie or something, a children's movie, sometimes there are monsters under the bed, so you might assign it a probability of 10 to the minus 15, yeah? or 10 to the minus 10. Then maybe to the mouse you assign 0 0.1 or 0 0.01, and then you get a probability also for the something else. So there is no true probability for this. So this depends on your flat. So it depends on your room, right? So it's different for everyone. So if you replace this example with a soccer example with München against Dortmund and blah, 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 also there, there are probabilities that one wins against the other, and your prior belief might depend whether you're a fan of one of the teams. Yeah? 
So it can be something very subjective. So here the probabilities can be very subjective, okay? Good, what else do we have to do to explain the model? Now we have to tell the forward model kind of, if we know there is a monster under the bed, what is the probability that there will be some noise, yeah? And notice, even if you don't believe in monsters, it's something you could think about, right? Of course, if there's a monster under my bed, it will be noisy with 0 0.9, right? So it's very likely. Even if I assign the probability that there is a monster, 10 to the minus 14, okay? So this is not inconsistent, or this is not um, like stupid to say. And then maybe P of having a noise, if there's a mouse, yeah, they also make noises, maybe 0 0.2. And if something else is under the bed, just air, maybe you are living next to a train station or something, okay, then there's also noise coming from under your bed. So it depends. However, notice these three numbers, they don't have to sum up to one, okay? Each of them is individual because only one of these three mutually exclusive variables is true. So we will only use one of these three, okay? Good. Now, what can, you, can we do with it? Let's use, um, first of all, the joint probabilities. I will explain and define more precisely what it is, but just like for our superficial understanding. So the joint probability is basically, what is the probability that there is a noise under your bed and that is, is a monster, okay? So the comma is like an end, like a logical end. And from our um, product rule, we know that we can multiply these things. And here, basically, basically, you also see when you, you can view these two numbers that you've chosen here, like turning knobs, and you can see what will happen to the joint probability when you turn the knobs. Yeah, so suppose you make it more and more likely to have a monster under the bed, then with the same rate, the probability of the joint event is also increasing. Yeah? Similarly, if you have the conditional probability and you decrease it or increase it with the same scaling, the other one will increase. And why is it like that? Why is there not a square here? Or why is it not a to the power of three? Or why not the logarithm multiplied or something? That follows from Cox's axiom. So he shows that plus and times are the right operations for these kind of things. So this is the best way to do it, looks like it, okay? Have a look at the paper if you want to see the details. So now let's apply base rule. Do we have everything? Yes, so this is base rule here. And we want to infer, given now our observation there's noise, we want to understand the source of the noise. I almost said cause, but causality is a different lecture, so I'm, I'm not using the word cause. So we want to have the source of the noise. And basically, Bayes rule tells us now to, how to invert this probability. And using our word knowledge, we can calculate all this. And when you... Um, yeah, play around. For example, there's a special sum rule down here. Since M, M, and E are mutually exclusive, if I summing up all those three values, I'm also getting the P of N, okay? That's just a generalization of the simpler um, sum rule that we had before. And up here, this is just a product rule to get this one. And now we can just plug in, for example, the joint probabilities here and do the calculation. You could also directly plug plug the ones in here that you those are the ones that you've chosen, but somehow you have to compute the p of n. Okay, so somehow you have to compute the normalization. By the way, this is a normalization constant down here. This thing down here is ensuring that the conditional probability again is the number between zero and one. This just is a side note. So this p of n is basically summing up all possibilities that could be put up here. So what possibilities do we have up here? P of n comma capital M, P of n comma little m, and P of n comma little e. Those are the three possibilities. And those numbers could be anything, right? Some, those are all numbers between 0 and 1, but they don't have to sum up to 1. But by dividing by their summation, I'm ensuring yeah, that this thing is again a probability between 0 and 1. So you see there are different perspectives on these rules. And you can look at them like formally that you want to have certain properties that they are kept. And they all nicely work together that, it's, that it makes sense. The other way to, to think about this quotient here is to say, I want to um, yeah, weight basically my probability of seeing a noisy monster compared to the other alternatives. Okay? So if there is another alternative, yeah, like whatever, um, a, a cat, yeah, the probability of noise, comma, cat, 
might be even larger than everything else because they are so loud at night and they are looking for the mouse. Um, then basically the, the bottom part here, yeah, the denominator is increasing. So this will decrease the probability of capital M given N, right? Because the bottom here is increasing if I have yet another alternative which has a very large number, okay? So here you see like the inner workings of Bayes rule, why it is like how it is. You are kind of renormalizing these joint probabilities with Bayes rule basically, okay? That's it. So again, we can have these formulas for all of them and I, I spelled them out for you for your pleasure to find the typos, but this is already an old slide, so generations of students before you have seen the, have found the typos. I hope this is now correct. Um, so again, Bayes rule in words, um, basically we are having hypotheses about what is going on under our bed without having heard something, without a measurement. Then we have our measurement, we are hearing noise, and then we need to update our beliefs about what's going on under the bed, okay? Good, um, yeah, and they also sum up to one, as I said, that was kind of an assumption, but curiously, also, when you calculate this, I mean, here are the formulas, right? And you can sum those up and you will get a one as well, okay? Why do you get them, by the way? I mean, yeah, when you see these three terms, they have all this P of N as a denominator, and they have basically, with the product rule, the joint distribution on top, and if you sum up the three joint distributions, you will get the P of N, which was just um, the formula down here, okay? So that's great, that's a great calculus, perfect. So let's go back to our um, deductive inference. So this is still our situation here. Um, now, how can probabilities help us here? So this was like the overview of the stuff. These properties do we want to have, okay? So let's do it like this. The semantics that I put in here, I choose it, and maybe I copied it from E.T. Jane's. I forgot which part is mine and which part is his. Probably most is his. But now to model it, yeah, we now say plausibility is measured as probability. Fine. Then we say this value P of B given A is the probability of B, assuming that A is true. The value P of B is the probability of B, assuming nothing. Okay, So we can always condition on the true statement if you want to. Then P of A being equal to 1 is the statement that A is true, assuming nothing. And if P of A is greater than P of B, we would say that A is more probable than B. What else do we have? We have now these basic laws of probabilities, and there are only two, product rule and sum rule, but there are different ways to write them. So what do I mean by this? So I mean P of A plus P of not A is equal to 1, which also logically kind of makes sense, right? It's basically saying tertium non datur, okay? It's either true or false. There's nothing, there's nothing third possible here. So you can rewrite it by now condition on another variable C. It doesn't change anything in the statement. You're just going to a different probability distribution that is now assuming that you know that C is true. Um, and then there's another um, statement here. If you are not summing out this variable, then you get a one. But if you have another variable that you are not summing out, you're getting this other variable. That's another variation of the sum rule. Good, and similar for the product rule, which is basically either defined or derived, um, we can also condition on C, okay? And basically, those are the important rules that you need to do probability calculations. And again, this is a bit hand wavy, and it's about discrete probabilities. The same exact rules hold for densities, which is which came to a surprise to me when I first saw it. But it holds for densities because when you learn it in um, Wahrscheinlichkeitstheorie 1 or 2, so this probability theory, is it called probability theory in English? I don't know, whatever. So if you learn it there, it's looking quite difficult, conditional probabilities. You define some Markov kernels and yeah, always you have to worry about measurability and so on. And at the end, it's really simple. Good, so now how can we use now our math here? So this is now the probabilistic reasoning of the stuff above, okay? It's looking a bit stupid sometimes, but sometimes it's looking really good. So let's first look at the right-hand side. So the statement, if A is true, then B is true, we would say that P of B given A is equal to 1, okay? This is like A implies B, 
Yeah, but this is just one interpretation of the thing. Now, if I want to show that A is false is implied by B of B is false, then I have to show that P of not A given not B is equal to 1. So the assumption B is false is the not B here, okay? And what I want to show is the not A. How can you prove this? This can be proved by Bayes' rule. And I will try to put it on the board in a second. If you do the modus ponens, the whole statement in this notation looks trivial because you're assuming that P of B given A is equal to 1, and that's exactly what you want to show. So this is a bit of a problem with the notation. So this case is not so super interesting. But this one is kind of, okay? Um, it also gets more interesting. So what about this getting more plausible stuff? Okay, that's even more interesting. So what am I showing here? Again, I'm assuming P of B given A is equal to 1. And now A becomes more plausible. I can write as an inequality like this. I could say P of A given B is greater or equal than P of A. So without knowing B, A has a certain plausibility or probability. But when I know B, yeah, the A becomes more plausible or more probable. Okay, so that's already nicer. So guess what the proof is? It's base rule. Similarly here, so we can also do it the other way around. And um, let's get more fancy. Let's say we are saying A is true, then B is more plausible. Okay, so this can be stated, and we have said already, P of B given A is greater or equal than P of B. Yeah, so that is basically the statement, if I know additionally A is true, B is more plausible than without knowing that one. And then I can show these kind of statements. And then this is getting not so trivial anymore, that this really holds for probability. So to me, it's surprising. So and at the end, you can show all these statements here. And I think that is exercise two or something on the sheet, okay, to prove these things. I will show you one of them. So let me pick the easiest. No, I, I pick the second easiest, okay? So this is the easiest, right? There's nothing to show. Let's try to prove this one here. And let's see whether I can do it. <clears throat> so do we have an eraser? Or maybe I can fit it in here on the side. <clears throat> so I'm assuming basically A implies B, kind of, right? So which basically is, this is my assumption, OK? Some people like to write like an A for assumption. And then, to zeigen, yeah, what we want to show is P of not A given not B is equal to 1. I think that was it, right? It looks right. Okay, otherwise I will fail, fail terribly. Okay, now how are we doing it? So we are using product rule, sum rule. That's it. Okay, and so let's start. So we start with the statement. And then we do blah, 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 and show that it's equal to 1. OK, so this is the structure of the proof. And on each of these equal signs, I'm applying some rule or product rule or something else. By the way, maybe some of you are not yet familiar with writing down a proof. Yeah? If you can't do this, use this class to learn it. OK, the TAs will give you feedback. But we are also nice people when we see, yeah, in principle, you understand it, but your, your way, how you write it up is a big mess then have a look how other people do it and try to improve on it. Okay, so let's first start. Let's get rid of the not A over here, okay? So how can we get rid of it? We replace it with 1 minus P of A given not B, okay? So that was the sum rule. Next, this thing needs to be turned around because if the not B is in front, again, we can use the 1 minus trick, okay? But first we need to flip it. How do we flip it? Using base rule, okay? So let's use base rule for that. I always have a hard time remembering how it works. Um, I think this thing goes to the back. P of not B. Ah, it's already wrong. Ah, whatever, let's. So this thing must be the same as that one. That's how I memorize it, okay? Divided by P of not B. Okay, so far so good. Um, we are almost there. I want to use my assumption. Yeah, so I need this P of B given A. Almost. 
let me rewrite it. P of not P, and here's P of A, and then here I have 1 minus P of P given A. Okay, so far so good. Some rule, base rule or product rule, some rule again, and next I plug in. So let's plug in the 1 in here. I get 1 minus 1 is equal to 0, and then the whole thing gets 0, and I get 0. Okay, this sounds like a bug, so where did I do a mistake? I forgot the 1 minus. And luckily, this is 1 minus 0, which is luckily the 1. Okay? Quite surprising. Uh, when I was working it out in Jane's book, where he's explaining this stuff, I was really surprised that it works so well and that it has so much, um, yeah, that it has so much intuitive content, these things. In particular, it's getting even better when you look at these inequalities. So, but it also works for these inequalities, okay? But your reasoning has to be a bit more precise and sometimes, so you have to use your assumption at the right location and then it just falls down. But there are only, only these product rule, sum rule, and your assumption, that's it. Good, so far so good. So again, let's have a motivating quote. The rules of probability combined with base rule, oh, for me it's part of the rules, make a complete reasoning system, one which includes traditional deductive logic as a special case. Interesting, yeah, that's really nice. So this is a statement from David Barber's book, which is also available free online, okay? And he's quoting James. Um, here's another one. The actual science of logic is conversant at present only with things either certain, impossible, or entirely doubtful, none of which we have to reason about. Therefore, the true logic for this world is the calculus of probabilities. Interesting, eh? Maxwell. So, I mean, as I said, for everything you want to say in a lecture, you will find some big guy who said it, right? But yeah, I mean, Maxwell is also, it's a good one. Good. So far, so good. Wow, we are taking really a long time. I wanted to show you a Jupyter notebook. I will do this in a second. Um, before that, let's go through the rest of the slides. So there are many different interpretations of probability, okay? So they are like these mathematical foundations, but then also philosophically, um, probabilities can mean many things. And also among the statisticians, there are different ways to have a foundation. And that's a, a fun, fun topic, at least for me. If I'm having, if I lose the fun on this topic, then I go back and say, ah, a sum rule and product rule, that's enough. I don't have to worry about where it comes from. But sometimes it's interesting to see where it's coming from. Um, also in AI and artificial intelligence, there's the area called reasoning under uncertainty. So reasoning is basically logical reasoning, right? So those are classical AI guys, okay? But they want to be able to deal with uncertain knowledge, like becoming more plausible, or maybe this happened, or maybe not, okay? And there are different schools, and I copied this from Julia Pearl's book. So three schools that he mentions in his book from 1988. So there's um, the logicists, so those are basically very mathematical logicists. For example, John McCarthy is a prominent um, person among this, so he's also the, the inventor of the Lisp programming language. Um, and the logicists, they use non-numerical techniques. So they really use like techniques coming from logic, like inference and trying to come up with calculus that can also do non-monotonic logic. Yeah, maybe as a side note, so what does non-monotonic logic mean? So typically in logic, if you have a set of axioms and you get a new axiom, the number of theorems that you can prove can only increase. So that's monotonically increasing if you have more axioms, you will have more theorems that are true. Yeah? Ultimately, if you have a wrong statement in your axioms, you can prove everything, okay? Because ex falso quod libet, there's another Latin statement for this. So from something false, everything follows, okay? So that's the monotonicity of classical logic. And so John McCarthy, during his career, was always interested in non-monotonic logics, where you could have something like, all birds fly, okay? So there's a pigeon, and I can infer the pigeon flies. However, then comes an ostrich, yeah, some bird that doesn't fly, and this is like completely destroying my theory that all birds are flying. However, that's confusing, right? Because it's so useful to have this statement in your head that all birds can fly. How can we have like 
a non-monotonic formalization for something like this. And he came up with a concept called circumscription, which is basically like an extension of these systems where he allows like exclusions from the rule, okay? Then there are the so-called neo-calculists. So they also use numerical techniques for these reasoning under uncertainty, but not probabilities, but something else, which is also plausible. In a way, Cox was maybe the first one, and by Cox it turned out to be probabilities that came out from his common sense suggestions. But there are others um, called denser shaver calculus or maybe fuzzy logic. So fuzzy logic, you might have heard. Maybe you have a shaver or something where it says controlled by fuzzy logic. So it was like 20 years ago, like a technology that you would print on, on things that you can buy. And then it was like, wow, it has fuzzy logic. That's so AI. So I want to have it. So that's another way to do it. Certain defectors, yet another one. And then there are the neo-probabilists. So the, the thing neo is always like neo, like noise. So the neo-probabilists, so the people who are now using probability theory together with some clever computations, as we will see, and there maybe Julia Pearl is the person who pushed this thing forward. So they are all interested in logical reasoning, like in expert systems, but they want to quantify their beliefs and their different approaches. And at the end, in my opinion, probabilities are the way to go. So that's the right way to formalize it. And Julia Pearl pushed it very far, these things. So we first came, I think, from classical AI, um, doing research on search and on heuristics and stuff. And then he came to expert systems and using probabilities in them. And I think he's, maybe one could say, invented Bayesian networks and this kind of stuff that we will also see. And then he moved on to use these Bayesian networks for causal structures. So he also wanted to model causality. Yeah? And for this work, then he later on he got the Turing Award, which is like the Nobel Prize in computer science. So this is a really interesting researcher. The other ones are also very interesting researchers. The stuff is also quite interesting. It's always interesting. So you have a certain problem, reasoning under uncertainty, and you have different brains coming up with different solutions. And so it's interesting to understand the differences and the things that are the same. So this is a summary, and I promised you that I tell you, um, and then I show you my Jupyter notebook. This we will see next time. Yeah. Um, what exactly do we mean by P of A and P of A comma B, for example? And the way we will see it next time, you can look already in the public folder, the slides are already there. I will start with propositional logic and introduce syntax and semantics, and then I will define like probabilities. Yeah? And of course, it's not super working for everything, but it's kind of interesting that you can do. And at the end, what we need is product rule and some rule. So those are the two rules that you need. And however you derive it, um, it doesn't matter. Let's switch to the Jupyter Notebook. So this is, again, my effort trying to have some programming in every class. So I just wanted to have like a simple calculator thing where I could play around with numbers for the monster and mouse. And you see how you could implement something like this that you learned today, how you would translate the math into simple computer code. So the only function I need from someone else is rand. OK, I like to call it rand. Python calls it random. I don't know why, I prefer rand. So it's a random number between zero and one, uniformly distributed. And now basically setting up the model, the most important thing from the programming perspective is to have a good notation. When you have a good notation, then coding is fun and easy. So here's my notation. I would write P underscore M for P of M, okay? So the underscore is like an interruption, and then comes the variable. I will also have P of n underscore e, and that is an abbreviation for n conditioned on e. Okay, now you might wonder, how do I write like uh, joint probabilities? I'm using p of n m, so without an underscore, just the two letters. Okay, and that should be the probability of n comma m. Okay, so that is the notation. And um, then basically now I can assign numbers for the monster. Maybe I change it here to uh, 10 to the minus 5. I have maybe a probability for the mouse. And then I calculate the probability for something else using the sum rule, okay? So this is the sum rule. Maybe I should um, put it back here following um, the sum rule, kind of. Then here I have an, um, an assert statement. That's another Python statement where you can assert a certain thing that must be true. 
So it must be true that the PE must be greater or equal to zero. Otherwise, the rest is garbage that comes out. If that is not the case, I can put a string which will be then an error message. Okay, so let's try that. So let me um, run it. So this is easy. So this worked. Let's break it. Okay, so let's say, um, whatever, let's put here something which is too large. And then I get an assertion error, the sum of the m and m options must not be larger than one, okay? So it could be more subtle than that because maybe I'm putting here a, a 0 0.3 and here I put a 0 0.8, so on first glance it all looks fine, right? But then when you run it, it breaks. So why am I showing it to you? Um, of course, it's trivial, right? I mean, it's so easy to check. However, later on when you play around with it, you might forget about it. And so you should put the assumption. Otherwise, everything else that you compute is garbage, okay? So why not put an assumption? It's really not costly anymore, so we can really afford it. Good, let's make the um, thing again a bit unlikely. And the mouse, ah, I pay enough rent, so I have 0.3. Okay, good. So it all works. Then the next thing about my model is I need to say, what's the probability that I hear a noise if there's a monster? And that's 0 0.99, right? Of course I hear noises if there's a monster, a monster under my bed. What's the probability with the mouse? 0 0.2. And maybe my flat is quite noisy, 0 0.1. Okay, so it can happen. And here now we can use these numbers and just multiply them yeah, to get these different joint probabilities. And um, yeah. Oh yeah, that's such a stupid error. Thank you very much. Looks like the notation was already useful. So with visual pattern matching, uh, you found the bug. Thank you very much. Uh, now it makes much more sense in numbers. Uh, of course, I mean, I would have made a story out of the wrong numbers too. Um, and we see, okay, the monster option is still quite unlikely, right? I mean, and the, yeah, it looks like the most likely option for having a noise and something under the bed is like the third one, okay? Good. And now I can also um, calculate the evidence, the so-called evidence. So how noisy is it in my house without worrying about what's under my bed? So, and this is calculated by summing up these joint probabilities here, okay? So that is 0 0.13. And then I have a nice function for base rule. You see, I mean, the whole thing is kind of trivial, right? The calculation is super easy. Uh, you have to do it in exercise three or two or one. Um, but I wanted to show you now how you would implement it maybe. So how can you do it? And it's nice to, to write a function that is called base rule, right? It's, you also, it's like another representation of a mathematical formula, which is as readable for computer scientists as a mathematical statement. So it's prior times likelihood divided by evidence, okay? That's exactly the definition. And then I'm using base rule just by plugging in the right numbers. I hope now I did the pattern matching right. I think I did. And I get like probabilities. Yeah, given that there's noise, I can now calculate the different probabilities, okay? And that's now a reweighting. So the summation of those should be exactly being equal to one. So let's check that. So the 53 plus 46, that's 99 something, and the rest is coming from the 10 to the minus five. Okay, so it's approximately correct, which is good. Which wouldn't be the case if I would have some weird numbers up here that don't make sense. Good, so that is a very simple way to implement it. And in the question on the exercise, you are asked to do your own numbers, to do the calculations once yourself, right? And then you can check with the notebook whether you made a mistake or not. Good, what else can we do? We can also sample from the model. So sampling basically now means, okay, great. So this is my word knowledge here without having observed noise. So this is just how I think, what is the probability of the stuff under my bed? And what is my word knowledge about having noise yeah, when something is under my bed. And I can now sample from it. I can randomly generate data, right? That might not be that what happened in the next night, but it just gives you an impression of what's going on, okay? Or whether the numbers make sense. So let's see what, how I did it. So for this, I implemented a coin flip, and the coin flip gets a parameter theta. So I could have used the parameter p, like probability for having heads, but P is overused already. So let's take a Greek letter theta. 
And basically now I'm calling rand, bracket open, bracket close, to get a random number between zero and one, and I look whether it's less than theta or not. So suppose theta is 0 0.1, yeah, then it's only in, in one-tenth of the cases I will be smaller. So in one-tenth of the cases, the return value will be true. And in nine-tenths of the cases, it will be false, okay? So this is a really nice function. And then I can sample from it. And again, the intention of the code is not to be super efficient, super general, here, here a class, there are some virtual classes and whatever, but to be super simple. So here's my super simple sampling function. I sample now a random number, and then I'm asking, is z less than my probability of my monster? If yes, I generate a string now. A monster is under the bed, and I generate like whether there's a noise or not, where the noise is a coin flip, where I put in the probability of noise, given that there's a monster. Then in the next case, my string will say a mouse is under the bed, and I flip the coin for the mouse. And then something else is under the bed, and I flip the coin under the, uh, for the something else. And then, depending on whether there's a noise generated, I continue the sentence one or the other way. Now, the most confusing thing is probably Z1. So what am I doing here, okay? And Give me the two minutes and I show you. Maybe some of you, for some of you, it's already obvious. Everyone else, please listen. So, this is from zero to one, an interval. And calling rand is throwing a random dart here on the line and I will hit it somewhere randomly. And when I do it very often, it will be all over the place. So now, the three probabilities of monster, mouse, and something else sum up to one. So I can also split the interval here in different parts. Okay, so this length, this measured length, this measure theory, plus this length plus this length is equal to one. So now, if I throw my dart and hit it, for example here, I would choose mouse, okay? So depending on the length. Now, how can I check this? First, I check whether my number that I get here, let's say 0 0.4, is larger than my P of M, like this one. What about this marker here? That is P of M plus P of little m, okay? That's why in the next thing I need to check whether this number is smaller than the summation of these, okay? And if that's not the case, I must have hit the last one. You see how this can be generalized for arbitrarily many options. You need to have a cumulative sum sum of the probabilities, and then do the comparison. Good. So let's get back to the notebook and let's run it. So the good thing is we can just run it 50 times. Yeah, and here we get like a whole month of events, what will happen at night, okay? Sometimes there's a mouse under the bed, but it is quiet, okay? Often here something else is under the bed, it's also quiet, only sometimes it makes some noise, and very rarely, uh, never ever, is there a monster. Okay, so here's no monster in my thing. So we could increase it, of course, uh, but you, you know, you can play around with it. And interestingly, I haven't seen any data, I just generated data and looked at my prior assumption, or at my model assumption, I can look at the world, how it would be randomly generated, whether it makes sense or not, okay? And then similar, suppose you are doing some computer vision and you're having an image prior or a model for images or something. Randomly sample from it and look at the images whether they look like you want to have them. Okay, that's the same thing here. Good, I think that's it for today. We are really slowly going our way, but I think it's fine. I mean, I think it's good to have a, a very detailed lecture here. So it will get more difficult at some point, for sure. It won't be so easy peasy like now, but um, if it's getting too difficult, you should stop me and I might help you. So thanks a lot for being here. See you on Monday.